Donna, you're welcome to begin. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Welcome to today's session for selecting Native authored literature for Native children in grades K through 12. My name is Dr. Donna Savis Burns, Oprah Mohawk Haudenosaunee, and I am the OIE Discretionary Group Leader. And I'm here to introduce a very special guest. Um, today, we are extremely fortunate to have with us Dr. Debbie Reese of Nambe Pueblo. Dr. Reese is an incredibly, incredibly committed and passionate educator who takes literature for children and young adults fe featuring Indigenous people and turns it on its head. She moves you beyond what has been taught and accepted in our classrooms and libraries and, and what has and has been has offered those analysis to challenge this, that status quo and to bring light the good, the bad, the ugly, the unknown, and the inaccurate that um, has been de demonstrated in books in order to be truthful and tell accuracy of our people um, to everybody of all ages. And we are thankful to have you here, Dr. Reese, and um, please take it away. All right, thank you. I'm, I'm really glad to be here today to talk about native authored literature. I do, I, I am pretty well known in the field of children's literature for um, doing some pretty extensive critiques of classic books, and I'll show you just a peek at that later. Um, but the bulk of what I'm going to share today is great books by Native writers. Um, so let's see if my screen's going to do the advancing here. There we go. Alrighty, so that's me. I'm Debbie Reese. I'm tribally enrolled at Nambe Owinge, which most of you probably would recognize as Nambe Pueblo. Um, Nambe Owinge is our word for ourselves. And I think you might know that many nations across the country are shifting from older ways of referring to themselves to our own ways in our own languages. So I'm from Nambe Owinge. I started a blog called American Indians in Children's Literature many, many years ago because as a professor, my writings were all behind paywalls. And I really wanted to reach teachers and librarians, educators, people who were reading children's books. Um, so I created a blog. It's um, widely used by lots of people. In my um, preparing to be here today, I was looking at some of your former um, videos on YouTube. And I listened to Dr, not Dr, but to Julian Guerrero, who was talking a few months ago about tribal sovereignty. He said that tribal sovereignty is hard and that tribal sovereignty is incredibly important. And I'm like, yeah, he's absolutely right. It's hard, but why is it hard? One of the reasons I firmly believe that it's hard is because it's not taught. Um, in, and because children's picture books and uh, young adult books and chapter books, all of those books that have been written by non-Native people kind of ignore that idea of sovereignty. It's just not there. And that's why I'm very careful in my critiques of those books. Um, and it is very incredibly important. So um, I hold to my heart what he said and think about how we can bring that forward in children's books. And I am psyched because Native writers are doing it more and more. This is a common thing amongst us all. As American Indians, we pass knowledge from one generation to the next through storytelling. Storytelling is so important. Those words that we share, all of that is so important. And when we're doing it from our Native spaces, it is rooted in sovereignty. And so I really like the theme and I'm happy to be here today to, to do this presentation. Storytelling, I have two images here. One is um, a little storyteller doll by Lynette Teller who is from Isleta Pueblo. She and the people who create the storytelling dolls capture that tradition of all of, of our nations, of an elder telling stories to the younger ones, passing on that knowledge. So that is one way, that oral tradition. But on the right, you're looking at a photograph of Marcy Rendon of the White Earth Nation sitting at her laptop because today, and we are very much a part of the day, and it bums me out that I have to say that we're still here um, and we use technology. So here's Marcy at her laptop writing stories. I'm going to show you a little a bit about one of her books later. 
but storytelling is a part of of our past, our present, and our future. And there are people who are native who are creating stories that I want to share. So I want to start out here um, by saying kuta. I hope that you know that I'm saying thank you. That's the way we say thank you in Tewa at Nambe Uinge. That's our language, Tewa. That's our way of saying thank you. Now, when I say Tewa and when I say Nambe Uinge, I am educating. I am using tribally specific words to get some information across. I hope that you, you are working with teachers and librarians and people in your schools who are using tribally specific words. And I, I have a hunch that you are, but in wider society, that does not happen. So any chance that you have to try and be tribally specific when you're talking about your work or books, take that opportunity and help people know we're not a monolith. We don't all wear feathered headdresses. We are part of the present day. So lots of opportunities will come your way and bringing every opportunity into your chance to speak about it will, is very important. I'm, I'm going to call some attention to the word I wrote there, kuta. It's not in italics. You probably remember in your own readings as you were growing up or as even in your adult readings, when you see a word that's not an English word, it's often put in italics. That's falling by the wayside. That's old school. More and more today, publishers and children's literature are recognizing that using italics otherized us. It made us exotic. It contributed to ways of not seeing us as dynamic people of the present day who are fighting for our sovereignty. So italics is falling by the way, said. You don't see that very much in children's books anymore. I'm going to show you lots of this ways that language appears in children's books. As I noted, sovereignty is more present than ever before in children's and young adult books. And you wonder, like, why? Why are we doing that? Well, for many reasons, including the fact that today, Native writers are creating the books they wish they had when they were young. They were reading books that did not have um, tribal specific language and didn't have sovereignty in them. They were looking for representation. They were looking for themselves. They were looking for mirrors of Native life. Now, that idea of mirrors comes from a woman. She's a literacy professor at Ohio State University. Her name is Dr. Rudine Sims Bishop. In 1991, she wrote an article called Mirrors, Windows, and Sliding Glass Doors. And what she was getting at is that when you open a book, you start reading the words on that page, when it is somehow about you, about your experiences, it's a mirror of who you are. So she brought forth this idea that books can be mirrors, windows, and sliding glass doors. And it took off, and you'll see it all over the place. It comes from her. So I, I'm always very careful to cite her because um, Native and scholars of color are not often cited. Um, so citing people is, is important to me because it matters. Where the ideas came from matter. So that's Dr. Bishop. And I was thinking about her metaphor a few years ago, and I was doing a presentation in Alaska, and I was looking for a window. I wanted to have like a way of putting the back of my head looking out, out of a window at an African-American authored book. So I was looking for, I was doing a Google search for uh, Pueblo windows. And I came to this one. And this is a really old photograph of our Kiva at Nambe and our community house that's part of the Kiva. Obviously, it was like after very hard rains, a season of hard rains, and we needed to replaster the Kiva. But anyway, there's a window there. And that's why it popped up in the Google search. But I was looking at that. Yeah, that won't work because it has a curtain in it. And then I thought, oh, wait a minute. That's part of what we do. When we have native writers, there are things we don't share because our elders teach us this is for us. This is not for everybody. So to Dr. Bishop's metaphor, I've added curtains that we as, as native people know that we keep things back. Native writers know they keep things back for various reasons. Probably you know some of what I'm talking about. Over time, we have had white anthropologists and ethnographers coming into our communities and literally peeking in our windows and writing down what they saw, misrepresenting what was there. That led to policies by United States governments, by state governments, by churches, where they were trying to shut down the, our religions. Um, that's changed now because we have pushed hard for that change. But those curtains, they're there and we protect that knowledge because we know that people who do not understand will misrepresent our knowledge. So native writers are using curtains. Most of you here, most of us, I, as part of you, did not grow up with books that function as mirrors. Here's a sample of what we had. Now you're looking at these books and you're going, oh yeah, I read that book. I read that in third grade. I read that in kindergarten. I read that when I was in high school. 
These are books that are filled with stereotypes, factual errors, and ceremonies and languages that were completely made up by non-native writers. Right in the center there is Island of the Blue Dolphins by Scott O'Dell. It's got a sticker on it. It won some awards. All of them did. But in them are stereotypes. In them are just plain out factual errors. And in the case of Island of the Blue Dolphins, Scott O'Dell made up a language, made up ceremonies. In these books, there are misrepresentations of who we are. And yet, because they have these stickers on them, teachers are using them. Part of what I think is absolutely necessary is that we get these books off the shelf because they are miseducating all children who read them. So I use a red X on books like that to signify that we should not be using this, these books because they miseducate children. We're not about censorship. We're not about banning books. We are about educating. And these books miseducate. So we, we really need to let them go. There's absolutely no reason to defend them, to defend the use of misrepresentation in children's books. We don't need to do that. So if you came to my website, you would find my writings about all of these books. If you want to ask me about them, we can do that later. We're going to move on now. The main point is these books are not by Native writers. These books are harmful. I want you either in your head or on a scrap of paper, or maybe on your laptop, to take about 15 seconds right now to write down the name of a non-Native child that you know and a Native child that you know. And I'm going to count to 20. So go ahead and do that now. All righty, here's the names that I wrote down. Obviously, I did this before the session, but the two names that I have written here are Luke and Ellie. Luke is not native. He's the child of one of my daughter's friends. Ellie is my little sister's granddaughter. So I have both of these children in my head and in my heart as I think about books and the impact they have on children. It's wrong to give Luke books with factual errors. Because Luke is going to grow up and maybe he's going to become a policymaker in Washington, D.C. He needs factual representation in the books that he reads. Ellie is going to be hurt by misrepresentations in a different way. Her emotions will be will come into play um, because of the kinds of things that she will see in some of those award winning and um, classic and popular books. We're going to look at one in particular in a few minutes and how that might impact Ellie. Anyway, I do this part of this session because I want you to remember that we're talking about kids. Too often people think, you know, we get into abstract theory land about um, educational theory, and I want us to always be centered on the fact that we're talking about children. So in New Mexico, there's 19 Pueblos. Amongst those 19, we have five unique languages. There's a map there of the Pueblos. Nambe is right in the center. Across of all of these Pueblos, we have unique ceremonies and songs and dances and stories. We have our own words, for example, for the word baby. Um, we, in Tewa, we have a word for baby. But in the United States culture, people think the Native American word for baby is papoose. You'll see that in crosswords. That's an example of misrepresentation having a large impact on society. Not correct. In the right side of your page, you're looking at our Kiva. As you can see, it's not, it's been plastered. It's in good shape right there. In the Kiva, we learn dances, we learn songs, we have ceremonies in there. That's where I took my daughter to get her Tewa name. We have good emotions there. We have goodness in our Kivas. And I'm telling you that in particular because I want you to look at this book. This is one of the books that I had a red X over on the earlier slide. Arrow to the Sun won the Caldecott Award. That's the biggest award in children's literature. And that book won the Caldecott Award. But look at its subtitle, A Pueblo Indian Tale. I told you there's 19. Which one are we talking about? Is Gerald McDermott telling us that we're all alike? I think he's trying to. Um, he, he's not being tribally specific at all. And when we start looking at the book, now I told you my daughter got her name in the Kiva. Our little kids go there and they have good emotions when they go there. But the way that Gerald McDermott presented a Kiva is as a scary place. In his story, he has this character who has to prove that the sun in the sky is his father. And to prove that, he has to go into these four kivas where he has to have he has to fight cats, 
and lightning and snakes and bees. It's a scary thing and it's a misrepresentation of what happens in Akiva. Now, what does Ellie do when her teacher's reading that book? She, she just maybe came out of the Akiva over the weekend. What's this book telling her? What is her teacher telling her? Now, she might be sitting there puzzling that out and now it's time for a spelling test. How is she going to perform on the spelling test when her heart is over here in this misrepresentation of what Akiva means? So these books have problems like that through and through, and we really need to let them go because they are driving a lot of what people think they know about who we are. So there's my red X. I do not recommend Arrow to the Sun. Now I want to move into the good part. Um, the happy part of my presentation is why we should select books by Native writers. More and more and more books by Native writers are coming out all the time. So here's some things that I want you to think about. Their books are tribally specific because they're looking for that representation that they didn't have when they were kids. Their books are tribally specific. They write from lived experiences on and off the reservation, reflecting present day life in either place, in many locations. So they're writing what they know. They write, they write books that reflect teachings about what to share and what not to share. Now, we are very careful in public communities about what we share. That's part of what our elders teach us, but I know that happens across others as well. Other nations, our, our leaders in our ceremonial spaces are very careful to teach us what we share and what we don't share. So that gets reflected in the books that Native writers create. Their books are honest about history. A lot of the books that, that I put that big red X over gloss native history. They misrepresent it. They get the facts wrong. They're not honest. Our writers know that these facts matter. So their books are honest about the history that we have experienced. And they write about sovereignty. Um, I'm just so excited to see that, that more and more books coming out every year that actually have nationhood in them, that have citizenship. These words are not in those books by non-native writers. They don't understand what that means or how much it matters to the well-being of our nations, to the well-being of our children. So these are some of the reasons why I think you should select books by Native writers. Now, using them in the classroom is important as well. They have to be used. They can't be sitting on a shelf. They have to be in use. So here's some suggestions for using them. Teachers should look for the author and illustrator notes in the backs of the book before they read the book aloud to children. I'm going to show you several pages of, excuse me, of, of notes because these notes are a new piece of publishing. Author notes did not used to be there in the way they are now. More and more publishers are giving authors lots of space to provide information to teachers right there in the book that can be used. And it should be used, especially studied before you read the book with kids, because it'll make you better informed about the story and what's in there. So read those notes. I want to use present tense verbs when introducing authors and illustrators. This idea of using present tense of authors and illustrators and their nations pushes against the idea that we don't exist anymore. That idea is that most of the verb tense that you see when people are talking about us is past tense. We can change that by using present tense verbs every time we talk about native writers and illustrators and their books and their nations. To further push against the idea that we are part of the present day and that we are part of modern society, you could show author, illustrator, and nation's websites. Um, when, when I was in DC for the opening of NMAI, it was astonishing that so many photographers were surprised that we have cell phones, that we are talking on cell phones, because I don't know, what did they think? We don't do that? Yeah, that's what they thought. Of course we do. We are part of modern society, and yes, we have websites and cell phones. So I want you to take those chances too to, to show our uses of technology. We're using it today. This is, this is a great example. And I want people to use native authored books all year round. Too much. It is the tendency in the United States to put all that stuff in November. But you know, and I know that all of us who are native are native every day of the year. Who we are should be reflected in the pages of books in the books on the shelf, in the lessons being presented in the classroom all year round, not just in November. So use these books all year round and think about books when you get them, when you read through them. What discipline area could I bring them into? They don't have to just be in a story time. They could be used in a math lesson or a science lesson. So think about the disciplinary opportunities that a book might have within it. But to do that, you've got to read the books. 
Okay, so now we're gonna look at some um, examples. This is Fry Bread by Kevin Millard. Kevin is an enrolled citizen of the Seminole Nation. That right there is what I want teachers to say when they bring this book and they hold it up and they're going to show it to kids in their classroom. I want teachers to say, Kevin Millard is an enrolled citizen of the Seminole Nation. There's that present tense verbs. There's the idea of enrollment uh, um, and citizenship in a nation. Too many people in the United States think that we are cultures. They don't understand that we are nations. Being nations means we are sovereign peoples who decide who our peoples are. We have ways of making those decisions. Our tribal councils make those decisions about who our citizens are. So being able to pack all of that information into a simple sentence like this is important. You could also show a photo of Kevin Millard. He is Black Seminole. He talks about his identity. Um, this is an important piece today because too many people don't understand that we do have Native peoples who have Black heritage as part of who they are. So this is Kevin's book, Fry Bread, and I'm going to show you some of the interior pages. The word nation is featured prominently. So when you open a book, you know, and it's the, the, the first part of the book, there's nothing there. In this book, it's filled with the names of tribal nations. That's the front um, end page and the back end page as well. The very front of the book, the very end of the book, when you open that, you will see names of nations there because Kevin and his um, illustrator, Juana Martinez, put those nations' names in the book. That's magnificent. That has never happened before. In the interior of the book, on the page called Fry British Nation, they have listed some more nations. So there's like over 700 tribal names in this book. So nation is featured prominently, and we're so excited when that happened. I got that, and I pointed to my name, my tribal nation's name, took a picture of it. Naomi Bishop, who is a former president of the American Indian Library Association, did the same. She studies children's books. She's very much involved in the American Indian Youth Literature Award that is given out by the American Indian Library Association. So that's her finger pointing to her tribal nation. Um, it was wonderful, the, the, ch the chance that we all have to point to our nation name in a children's book. Kevin's book has eight pages of author's notes. That's a first. I have never seen a children's book that has that many pages in it that can help a teacher understand what's going on on a particular page. So here is the author's note for the Fry Bredis Nation page that we just looked at. Here he talks about how many federally recognized nations there are. He talks about state recognition. And he goes on to say a good bit about many different nations. So excellent author's note here, packed with information that you can use. Um, here is another interior page from the book where I, I said earlier that Native writers are not shying away from factual information. So here we're looking at the part of the book where he talks about why do we have fry bread? And of course, fry bread is controversial because of the health concerns that people have with it. He talks about that too in the author's note. But on this page here, he says fry bread is history. And he talks about the long walk and the fact that we were given rations and we made new recipes from what we were given. So here is that part of the book. Oh, I missed a page here. There, that one. Um, this page is also an interior page. Fry bread is food. And what you see when you're looking at the family that's making fry bread in this book, they all look different. Part of what I really think is crucial is that Students, children, readers, adults, everybody can see some semblance of themselves in a book. And here we see a range of hair texture, a range of skin color. We are getting the idea that we do look different. The idea of who we are is important. We are not monolithic people with long, dark, black hair and dark skin. We're citizens of nations and it doesn't matter what we look like. So here, the diversity in physical appearance pushes back on the stereotypical ideas of what we should look like, according to those books that I read X. Um, also on this page, the children are holding store-bought products. You see that one child, the second one from the left is holding up a canister of salt. You know where they got that? At the grocery store. Because yes, we're people of the present day. Yes, we shop at the grocery store. Yes. Some of our people go hunting and, and bring um, elk and deer meat into our homes, but we also go to the grocery store. So these are some little pieces throughout Kevin's book that I really appreciate very much. This is Forever Cousins 
It is by Laurel Goodluck, and here I have a photo of Laurel. Laurel Goodluck is Mandan, Hidatsa, and Chinchin, and Jonathan Nelson, the illustrator, is Danae. Their story is about these two little girls. Now, this is a picture book, and I am showing you several picture books, and I want to make the point very clearly that picture books are not just for little kids. Picture books can be used in upper elementary, they can be used in middle school, they can be used in high school. Some of these notes are packed with information that, uh, that older readers can study and use to, for example, take that book home and read it to a younger sibling, or maybe take the book into, a, into another part of the school and do the read a lot for a, a storytelling in a kindergarten classroom. The potential for using picture books is not Fully realized. So I would really like to see more people using picture books. So here's these two cousins on the cover of the book. You can tell they like each other. They have dolls. And we're going to take a look at, so at the author's note where um, you see that their names are Amanda and Kara. There's a little boy named Forrest who's also in the book. But Amanda and Kara represent the many cousins the author and her sister grew up with in the 60s and 70s in California's Bay Area suburbs. All right. So here we have a story that is set partly in the Bay Area because the author grew up there. Um, we are everywhere, Native people on and off reservations. And so that book helps us get that point across. Further in the author's note, she talks about what it means to be a dual citizen, that you be enrolled members of sovereign nations and of the United States. And she talks about what it means to be a sovereign nation in that author's note. Further down in the author's note, she talks about why her family ended up in, in this, the Bay Area the Indian Relocation Act. This is the first time that I have seen an act, this act in particular, included in the children's book. This has so much potential. So I really hope that people will pick up picture books and think about ways, think about using them in ways you have not before. So here's the two little girls, interior page. They agree sunflowers are beautiful, powwow dancing is fun, and choke cherry jam on toast is the best. So that's them and their life there in the San Francisco Bay Area. But one family's decided to move back home. So one family moves back to the reservation. There's a powwow happening. Obviously, the girl's unhappy. She's sad. You can see the powwow dancers there in the background. You can see it's a reservation setting because of the, uh, the hills in the back and the arbor. And then on the right, you see the little girl who's at the powwow in San Francisco Bay Area. And you see the, the buildings in the background of that. So they're sad because they're not together. Um, as they have been before, but they use their phones to keep in touch. So here you see them both talking to each other using their cell phones, showing each other their new backpacks and new lunch boxes, staying in touch, using technology. It seems like a small thing, but I think it's a really important thing. Here on the, as the story progresses, um, the little girls get back together again because there's a gathering at home on the reservation. And on the last day, the family has a ceremony. There's a sweet, there's a scent of sweet grass and burning sage. There's the beat of a drum and an ancient song. Ma'u explains relationships and the new baby gets a Hidatsa name. All right, so we have that much information there. But you don't have more than that because the author, Laurel Goodluck, drew a curtain on the Hidatsa naming ceremony. We see too many people in the United States who want to be Indian or do an Indian thing. And they want naming ceremonies so that they can do that. Laurel didn't do that. She didn't share the de that depth of information. We get a peek at it, but we don't need all the details. Laurel is drawing a curtain. So, great book. Here's another one that I recommend. We are still here. Native American Truths. Everyone should know. It's by Tracy Sorrell, who's a citizen of the Cherokee Nation. On the cover, just look at that cover. Her author is not, uh, her illustrator is not Native. But, but they worked closely to create the illustrations. And what you see on the cover there is children holding flags. And I generally try to incorporate that idea that being a nation means you probably have a tribal flag. When you go to DC to the museum, you see tribal flags all over the place. Here in this book, you see tribal flags on the cover. Getting across that idea visually through um, um, art that we are nations of people. So this is her book. And in it, the teacher is assigning children topics to do Indigenous Peoples Day project presentations. And here you see the topics that they're being assigned. Um, wonderful. You don't see these even in books in high school. Um, so I really get very excited when I start to think about the potential that this book has for helping young children, but college students too, to understand all of these topics and why they matter. When you start flipping through the pages, you'll get to this one page about tribal activism. 
It's about Alcatraz and the takeover of Alcatraz. Um, I just find one page after another in this book to be outstanding, and I hope you look for that. Contenders, two Native baseball players, one World Series, also by Tracy. In this case, the illustrations are done by Aragon Starr, who's an enrolled member of the Kickapoo tribe of Oklahoma. She's awesome. Um, and she's a big baseball fan. So it was perfect for her to be selected to the illustrations for this particular book. Um, she's done many kinds of books. She's done graphic novels. On the right is Super Indian, one of her graphic novels. And I'm taking this from her website. So here's an opportunity where you might share her website with children in the classroom. Um, so you see her holding up a beaded medallion somebody made for her of, of the character on the cover of her graphic novel, Super Indian. So that's Aragon's website. When you start looking through the book she's written, she's illustrated, you learn about two Ojibwe, about two baseball players. The first one is an Ojibwe one. So I just have a tiny picture up there of him um, because I want you to look at this one. Here is John Tortoise Myers, and he is Kawia. There are no children's books about Kawia people. So here we have a book that will function as a mirror for children in California, in particular for children who are of the Kawia tribe. So wonderful book, wonderfully illustrated about baseball. And you have that opportunity there to show kids the Kawia um, Nation's website. So all these books have so many opportunities for us to expand what people know about who we are. Um, as you read the book, you learn a lot about the two players, but you also learn about this particular page and something that happened here. Just before the, just before the first game of the World Series in 1911, John poses on the field with Charles, whom he describes as one of the nicest people you'd ever meet. But guess what the New York Times did? They printed this. Maybe they wished they had tomahawks in their hands instead of a bat and a baseball. At the height of their careers, Charles and John couldn't escape the racism that infests even one of the country's leading newspapers. That's true today. We see this over and over. We still have uh, mainstream um, writers who do sports pages and newspapers using stereotypical ideas about who we are to write about us. We see fans using racist slurs um, against Native players in various sports. So I like that this is here. It creates awareness. Of, of what um, we endure. I very much like this page in towards the end of the book because here um, the author and illustrator have made it possible for many different representations to be here, many different mirrors. If you're Pawnee, there's Moses Yellow Robe. If you're Sack and Fox, there's Jim Thorpe. If you're Cherokee, there's Ben Tincup. These, these, this array of um, baseball playing cards is perfect, gives lots of opportunities for representation or mirrors. And on the bottom, they have included this page that shows us as Native people saying no to the stereotypical kinds of things that we encounter, especially on the sports field. So great book. Rock Your Mocks didn't come out yet, but it will be out soon. You should make sure you put it in your order um, with whatever place you buy books from. Rock Your Mocks is, of course, a day that we started to celebrate starting in 2011 when this idea that we should wear our moccasins took off. So Laurel has this book, Rock Your Mocks. Here's a piece of the, pay of the author's note at the back where she talks about how that day came into being. And as you turn the pages of the book, you see kids in a present day neighborhood, they're wearing their moccasins. Um, one of them goes to school and you see in his school, they're learning some Ojibwe um, language, in this case, the, the numbers. So love it, love it, love it, because we see so much good. We see modern day Native people learning their language in the book. A letter for Bob. This one just came out recently and I absolutely adore this because, you know, res cars, this is a family and this is their car and its name is Bob. And they're getting rid of Bob. It's time they need a bigger vehicle because the family is growing. So the, the main character in the book is writing a letter to Bob, remembering all the things they did together. The book is by Kim Rogers, who's an enrolled member of Wichita and affiliated tribes. I really like this book because of all that she is including in that letter about grandma, about grandpa, what happened um, to them. Great book. Really, really recommend that. I hope you know about Spirit Rangers, the show that's on Netflix. Um, it's taking off and doing quite well. But there are books to that go with that. There are companion books that go with the, with the films, with the shows on Netflix. Um, look for them. They are um, by Carissa Valencia, who's a key figure in the production of the show. She's an enrolled member of the Santa Inez Band of Shumash. And when you 
op get the book and open the book, you'll see that she has tribally specific information about um, the nations that are in the particular book that we're looking at. So highly recommend that you look for those books as well. Charlene Willig McManus, she was a tribal member of the Confederate Tribes of Grand Ronde. She is deceased. Um, she passed away before the book was finished and Tracy Sorrell helped finish the book, um, writing of the book. It's called Indian No More. And it's actually based on Charlene's family story of when her tribe was terminated. Now, most of you here know that a lot of tribes were terminated in the 50s. So this book is about that, about being terminated, about what happens when you are Indian no more because the federal government terminated your tribe. And along with termination was relocation. So this family moved to Los Angeles. And so the book that, that we have in Indian No More, the story you have in Indian No More is about both of those things and about how that family retained who they are as Native people. Really recommend that. Early reader chapter books. You know, these are the ones that kids get when they're starting to read on their own. Most of them are um, just about other people, but here you have some that are about Native kids. In this case, the kid is Jojo McCoons. She's an Ojibwe kid, and she's um, obviously a modern day kid. And she's going to school and she's making friends and having one experience after another with her grandma. Um, who we read when we say grandma in the book, it's in the Ojibwe language, which is now I just forgot. Um, Kukum. So there are Ojibwe words throughout this book. They're by Don Quigley, who's a citizen of the Turtle Mountain Band of Ojibwe. And I keep saying who they are and their tribal nation because I want you to do that. I want you to be tribally specific. I want you to use that word is as much as you can. Early reader nonfiction. All right, so we have lots of nonfiction books out there. A few years ago, I did a study of, of nonfiction, and we we found that most of the nonfiction biographies of women were Pocahontas and um, Sacagawea. Um, and of men, they were of Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse. In other words, people of the past. And we are very much a people of the present, and so we need books that reflect that. So this She Persisted series features Native women of the present day, like Deb Holland, of course, Wilma Mankiller and Maria Talchi. So these are excellent early reader nonfiction books that should be in every classroom. We also have Native women in leadership um, positions that we had not seen before. So here's three books about that. This is on the left is Step Into Reading version. So it's kind of like the early reader. The first woman Cherokee chief, Wilma Pearl Mankiller. In the center is Peggy Flanagan, about the Lieutenant Governor of Michigan and uh, I'm sorry of Minnesota it's by Jessica Ingle King all of these are Native writers excuse me on the right is Deb Holland first Native American Cabinet Secretary written by Jill Dorfler and Matthew J Martinez Deb Holland is Pueblo Matthew J Martinez is Pueblo so I really like all of these books we do have some historical fiction getting written. Um, I indicated that most writers are writing books they wish they had when they were kids, and that means books set in the present day. Not many Native writers are writing historical fiction. Erdrich did. So here's her series. I hope you have this in your libraries. There are five titles in the um, Birch Bark House series that she did. So I highly recommend that as well. This young man is Brian Young. He has two books out, um, Healer of the Water Monster and Heroes of the Water Monster. He is fluent in his language. On the left is a photo of Brian from his website um, where he uses his language extensively. When you open the pages of his book, the titles of the book chapters are in his language. So I like seeing the use of native language in interesting ways for grandma as Don Quigley did, but here for numbers and elsewhere, he uses it quite a lot. So um, Brian Young's books are terrific. How about nonfiction about native athletes? I showed you contenders. Um, there's another um, early nonfiction biography about um, Charles Albert Bender. This is by Cade Ferris. You can get a copy of that. So we're looking at, at sports figures. On the right is Unstoppable by Art Colson. The subtitle of that is How Jim Thorpe and the Carlisle Indian School Football Team Defeated Army. So great books written by Native people who have connections to the people they're writing about. They bring those connections into the writing, to the creation of those books. This is due out later this year, Resball. 
It's fiction about a native athlete. It's written by Byron Graves, who is an Ojibwe author from the Red Lake Nation. And he's got one of the things that I think is also very exciting is that native writers are creating playlists for their books. Here's his playlist. Um, uh, number four is What Made the Red Man Red. I'm hoping you know Frank Lawn's um, uh, um, song, What Made the Red Man Red, because he, he in that song is poking at um, the Disney Peter Pan video and song what made the red man red um where native people are pushing back on misrepresentations like those in peter pan but here's some more cynthia lytic smith is speaking back to classics in really exciting ways that's her on the left she's standing in front of her tribal flag at nmai she is a citizen of the muscogee creek nation the two books in the center are about a single family um, a Muscogee Creek family, Hearts Unbroken is on the left. It came out first. And in that book, her character wants to be in the school play, but they're going to be doing um, The Wizard of Oz. And her brother is assigned to do a program where he talks about the author. And as he does that, he finds out about L. Frank Baum's editorials. So that becomes part of the story. On the right is the sequel to that the Harvest House in that one, part of what we have going on in Harvest House is Native women who are experiencing violence and missing, going missing, something that we are all concerned with. Um, but she also pushes back on a classic story that's being read in the student classroom. Um, it's um, Hawthorne's Young Goodman Brown, Young Goodman Brown, I think is the title. And there is a devilish Indian in there. And so the teacher invites the kids to have a conversation about the way that Hawthorne is representing Native people. So I really like the way that she's pushing back on those classics, but she also does that with Sisters of the Never Sea on the right. It's a Native perspective on Barry's Peter Pan. Um, look at the cover, that's really important because the little girl in the foreground is Lily and she's a black Muscogee character. Um, so Cynthia is also incorporating that, that idea that we have black Indians within our communities. Um, they push back really hard. On, on Peter Pan. And I really think that high school kids could do so much reading Sisters of the Never Sea because they share in common a knowledge of what the Peter Pan story is about. Um, fiction about not being enrollable. I, I, I will assume that you are following growing conversations about people who are not enrolled, who are misrepresenting themselves as being native. Um, that's a problem. But we also have the fact that many of our nations have criteria in place that means some of our young people can't be enrolled because they don't meet the criteria that our tribes have set up to be enrolled. So this book, We Still Belong by Christine Day, is about that. The little girl on the cover, her mother and her grandfather are enrolled, but she cannot be enrolled. She doesn't have the right blood quantum to be enrolled. So the story is in part about how she's still a part of that tribe. Um, how she still belongs, even though she doesn't have the blood quantum to be enrolled. There's lots of information in the author's note about that. Christine Day is a citizen of the Upper Skagit Indian tribe. This is her fourth book, so definitely look for her work. On, uh, on the top of page one where her book starts, you see that she also brings in native language into her books. This here on the left is Eric Gansworth. He's a member of the EO clan, enrolled Onondaga, born and raised at the Tuscarora Reservation. He has these four books out. Um, that's a photo of me and Eric when his If I Ever Get Out of Here came out several years ago. Now, he grew up on a reservation. So Eric and I have a similar or a shared experience of having grown up on a reservation. He in New York, me in New Mexico, but some of what we experience is the same. So his books in particular resonate with me, even though we're hundreds of miles apart. Um, in his books, he uses uh, music extensively. And you see that by the cover of the books where he's incorporating music. He plays music himself, Eric does. So here we have in If I Ever Get Out of Here, a little boy named Lewis who has a new friend named George. And George's dad is going to take these two middle grade boys across the border into Canada to go to a concert. And as they're approaching the border where they have to um, show their IDs, Mr. Haddonfield asks Lewis if he has his ID. And Lewis says, yes, sir. And he reaches into his wallet and he says, my worn red construction paper reservation ID looked even shoddier than usual next to their neat little covered passport booklets. Booklets. What is this? He said, it's my ID. Son, you won't be able to get across the border with this. 
I'll do what I can to vouch for you. But if they have any questions about who you are, my hands are, don't worry, sir. I do this all the time. We member nations of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy have a treaty with the US and Canadian governments. Canada isn't a foreign country to us. It's part of our territory and we can cross into it with just our ID cards. So this is a fact of life for this people on that border area. They have a treaty that makes it possible for them to cross the border. So Eric is naturally bringing that fact of his life experience into his book. That's just one example of that. I hope you know who this is. Angeline Bowie is bringing tremendous visibility to all of us in the media through her writing. First came out Firekeeper's Daughter a few years ago, got, got um, picked up and read by many, many people. In fact, I think the Obama Foundation is turning it into a series for Netflix. Her new book, which is a sequel to that, or it's not a sequel, it's her second book featuring some of the same characters. It's called Warrior Girl on Earth. Recently, she was um, interviewed on the Washington Post live channel talking about that book. So definitely, we have visibility that we have not had before from writers like Angeline. Here, if you're an adult who likes mysteries, I want you to stop reading Tony Hillerman. Some of his, what he has done with Navajo stories are not, it's not good. Navajo people have uh, concerns about that. He, uh, he and his daughter, um, Hillerman's dead, but his daughter is picking up his writing. So her books are out there, but I really want you to set those aside and reach for books by Native writers. So if you're a mystery reader, look for Marcy Rendon's Cash Black Bear Mysteries. Because here you'll find Iqua. Here you find foster families. Here you find someone who knows what she's talking about um, in a mystery format. So look for um, Marcy's books, Murder on the Red River, Girl Gone Missing, and Sinister Grave, all ones that I highly recommend that you get. Take them to the beach if you are a beachgoer. It is summertime. You will be having more relaxing time, I hope. So look at her books. Now, I've just showed you many, many books and you may be coming away with the impression that there are a lot of them, but there really aren't. On the left, you're looking at a graphic diversity in children's books 2018. It's generated from the data that's here is generated at the University of Wisconsin Madison in their Cooperative Children's Book Center. Every year, publishers send all their books there. The staff there sorts and counts, reads, sorts and counts. Um, they're not looking at quality of the work. They're looking at what the work is about what the book is about. So here you see a graphic representation of the metaphor of mirrors. And you see that on the right, a white child has lots of mirrors because most of the books that come out have white characters in them. Over on the very far left, you see the native character in the tiny gray print at the bottom, 23 books in 2018. At the time the graphic was made, 23 books or 1% of the over 3000 books that came out had native characters in them. But um, that's 23 books. And if you look on the right, you see the current data from 2022, that, that in 2022, there were only 36 books by Native writers. Um, there were another 10 books that were about Native people that were not written by Native writers. So, so the data is important. And I'm sharing that because you need to know that you need to buy these books. Part of what I see happening is that if you look at the feet of the children here, the books by non-native writers have stereotypes and bias. And so when we actually start to look at the books themselves, we, those numbers drop. So there might've been 23 books in 2018, but when I read them, only half of them were ones that were good mirrors for children. So at the feet of the children, we incorporated, I'm saying we because I helped make the graphic. We um, showed the mirrors getting smaller in size as you go from the center to the left, because that's the factual data representation. But the mirrors are cracked and broken be and smaller because not all representation is good. So you need to be paying attention to the books that are coming out and the quality of the books. A lot of people cite this data and don't know that their books, is, that it's not about quality, it's about number. Um, okay, so winding down, this is my last slide. When, we, when, when I saw that graphic, um, and I started thinking about how can I, how else can I use that graphic? I asked the illustrator to please, please, please make me uh, the, the native boy on the far left smiling and with his arm out so that I could say, get this book. So I use that graphic now in my presentations here. The boy is holding Sharice's big voice. 
earlier in um, the opening um, presentation, um, Guerrero was talking about how we should be looking at treaties. When you get Charissa's big voice and you start paging through that, you get to the page where she has gone to law school and you see a, and the art on that page shows the treaties that she's studying. See, that's an example of how if you're using this picture book with high school kids, you can research that treaty and you can bring that treaty to life and what it means to that nation, how it impacts that nation's life today, how Sharice might be speaking for her nation with regard to that particular treaty. Anyway, I'm really high on Sharice's voice, big voice in particular, because we are in what we're calling in the United States Pride Month. And she does not shy away from the fact that she's a lesbian. It's in the book. So Sharice's big voice is really high on my list. On the right are other books, some that I talked about, some that I did not. We are Water Protectors, an Indigenous People's History of the United States. I helped adapt that one. Um, all of these terrific books that I really want you to buy in bulk and put into every classroom and encourage kids to see them. Encourage librarians to do book programming about them. If there's a concert coming up and you know kids are excited about that, put Eric's books on display. Use every chance you can to bring our sovereignty and who we are as Native people of the present day who are creating books to become part of our everyday experience in every school classroom, every library in the country. So that's my last slide. Um, I think we have a question slide, so I'll pause there. Thank you so much, Dr. Reese. Fabulous information. And I'm looking at the chat. Some of people who were commenting put it in the hosts and panelists section and not for everyone. So we can um, share that out hopefully a little bit later. Um, but you've got a lot of shout outs and wonderful comments um, to the information shared. Um, at this time, uh, we'd like to open it up for questions in the chat box. And there is right now just one. Um, and the question is, are many of these books written by youth? None of these books are written by youth. Um, there are a couple that are on my website by a young Apache um, who was at Standing Rock. So there, that's the only book that I can think of at this moment that was written by a young person. That does not mean that they should not be writing. I really enjoyed watching the art, the presentation of the Art and Story Awards earlier. And as I was looking at that, I thought, you know, this could be a children's book and that could be a children's book. Um, because I think that's important that we have, we have um, representation at every level in every way, including books written by young people. Thank you. Any questions? Question came in uh, the chat asking any Alaska Native authors? Yes, I have a couple of those that I could tell you about. Um, Rainy Hobson, um, she also uses her uh, Alaska Native name and it's not coming to me at the moment, but she has written a short story, um, a couple of short stories and a couple of anthologies that you can find on my website. Um, if you write to me, um, let's see, we, uh, Donna, can somebody send out my email address, um, either in the chat or in a follow-up email that might be going out? Absolutely. If you send, okay, because, because a lot of what you see on my website is there because a teacher or a parent or a librarian wrote to ask me about a book. So in this case, you would write to me in the subject line, say that you were in the OIE, um, session, and then I'll highlight, I'll bring your, I'll answer your email first. Um, because I could, I can give you some writings by native writers um, in Alaska. Um, Rainy is the one I'm thinking of, but there's also some really cool board books by um, four different Alaska native writers um, that I could recommend to you. So write to me and I'll send that info to you. We have another question from Brandon John. Is there a, is there a guideline on how to start to have a book published? Oh, um, <clears throat> one of the things that you should know about if you are interested in writing books for children is that there are um, there is a new imprint. Now, the, the Heart Drum imprint, I showed you the um, books by Cynthia Lytick Smith and by Christine Day. Those are all published by HarperCollins. Many of the books I shared you, with you are from HarperCollins. HarperCollins is a big publisher. 
and they launched a native imprint. That means they decided a few years ago that they were going to put some money into the publication of books by native writers. Not, not everybody, but just by native writers. That's what an imprint is. It's dedicated to a certain topic or a certain group of people. So they have an imprint called Heart Drum that Cynthia Lytic Smith is working on. And so she's bringing a lot of these books out as a writer herself, but also as somebody that's working with HarperCollins to get those books out there. You could write to her, write to me, and I will get you the information that you can use to write to her. If you have an idea, something you want to create, that, that's one place that you can start. There are also workshops for Native writers that take place at Highlights Foundation. Um, you remember the Highlights little um, booklets that you got um, when you were a kid. They have a Highlights Foundation Writing Center in Pennsylvania, uh, and sometimes they have Native writers hosting that and creating workshopping about how to write a Native story, what to do, what not to do, how to talk to publishers, how to work with editors, things like that. So that's another one. There is also an organization called We Need Diverse Books that sponsors a writing um, intensive for people who want to write children's books. And I think that um, India No More by Charlene Willing McManus, the one that I showed earlier in the session, she was one of the people that was in one of those um, workshops. So there's opportunities. Um, you can also go the self-publishing route. The, the difficulty about being a self-published writer is that um, you're on your own and uh, you would need tremendous word of mouth to get your book out. That's not a bad thing, but when you have a big publisher publishing your book, they will help you get the book out in larger numbers and distribute it in bigger um, ways than a self-published book can fare. So um, those are some of the thoughts I have about trying to get published yourself. It's the writing workshops available to you. Thank you. And Trinidad Yazzie asked, in addition to writing, how would we support our youth in publishing their work? Or what resources do you recommend for research? Um, let's see. It, as, as educators trying to help kids become published, is that kind of what you're after? That's what I, it's I get, I get. OK, I think you work with them on their writing first, um, help them with um, polishing that writing. And then I think I think entering contests like the one that was sponsored here um, are important. Getting getting their work out, getting it read, having other people look at it. I think that's all part of what it takes to get published. And there are also um, writers, the writers that I was talking about their books, they do webinars um, where they talk about how they got started. So I think being able to find that kind of um, guidance about how, excuse me, about how a person got to where they are now is also helpful. I wish I had more concrete information for you, but th that does, as, as far as I know, there's not a how-to for that. Elena Jackson asks, do you know if any of the authors had pushback from their community leaders to publish using their language? Good question. Um, I do not know of that. I do know that, um, for example, sometime in the 90s, some, Simon Ortiz, I think it was, had a children's book come out and it was printed in Carrie's and there were some people who were unhappy with that. So I know that there are concerns out there about native languages being printed. Um, and as far as I know, none of the people who I'm presenting today have received pushback for using their language in their books. Um, I know there's a huge conversation, very contested conversation going on right now with Lakota language and uh, the Lakota language consortium, which as far as I understand it has um, copyrighted their materials, many of which they created with the help of Lakota elders who are now concerned about their own access to their own language materials. So I don't want to get too far down that road because I'm not sure that's where you're going. To answer the question, I don't know if Native writers of the books that I presented today have received blowback from using their language. We have another question. Any suggestions on how to motivate our young readers to put down their iPhones? <laughs> um, well, Interestingly, they can see these writers reading their books on their iPhones. Um, so I think I would encourage you to look for videos of Native writers who are actually reading their books aloud for kids. 
um, and having great, great conversations with kids in, in that format. Um, Kevin Millard did that with, with a video and it was, it was terrific. He was talking to third graders and he recorded the whole thing. It was great. Um, but putting down their iPhones, I think part of, you know, that's our problem too, right? We are all in this moment of being somewhat addicted to technology. Um, in large part, that's because a lot of what's available to us has not reflected us. So that's why I was talking about Marcy's books. If you like mysteries and you kind of reach for just mysteries by anybody, um, reach for her books because they reflect uh, Native experiences for, for an adult reader. And I do think that part of why kids turn away from books, and I, I think actually there's a study about some of this a few years ago by Stephanie Freiberg, um, John Tipiconic, um, a few, Susan Faircloth. Yeah, they did a study about kids and why they stop engaging in school. It's because they don't see anything that looks like them in the materials. So they're, they're um, disengaging in the classroom. But I think using their iPhone is also a method of disengaging. And maybe that's because they don't know what's there. Um, they don't see books that make them feel good about who they are. Uh, so I think that maybe just really helping them see these books, really helping them find these books. They, they're turned off to reading maybe because all they've seen is stereotypes. Who wants to see that? Nobody. So um, showing them the alternatives I think might help. Okay, and in the question and answer, I have Dr. Reese, would you be available for a quick Zoom call regarding writing a book? I have a Native American friend who may appreciate your help and suggestions. Um, send me an email and let's talk. I, I don't generally do that kind of uh, individual Zoom kind of work because I have, I'm trying to do a bigger impact, um, but send me an email and we'll see. Okay, and right now there aren't any more questions. If anyone has any additional questions, please go ahead and either put them in the question and answer box or in the webinar chat, and we'll make sure Dr. Reese gets a chance to answer. Uh, yes, Renuka, that her email was shared in the chat. And we'll go ahead and um, share that again. Charlotte or Sarah, can one of you make a copy of the chat for me before it goes away? And then I'll have that as a record of things I might be able to address as well. I think I'm gonna hit the stop share. Yeah, I did. Do write to me with your questions and comments because I, what you see on my website, like I said, is there because somebody wrote and asked. Um, um, I, I used to be a professor in American Indian Studies. I have lots of resources, lots of friends in academic spaces who I can write to when I'm not sure about something. So I'm a resource, use me in that way. We really appreciate your time and expertise, Dr. Reese. Thank you so much for being here. And um, oh, anyway, Stacy, still there, don't forget to put in um, the everyone reply for the chat for everyone. Um, if you want your, a lot of them are going to the back channel. So make sure to click everybody when you're putting your chat in. I have a terrific article that I can share um, that was written by a social studies professor who is Native, 
and it's about incorporating sovereignty in, into your civics lesson plans. Oh, wow. That's Leilani, Sub, Leilani Subzalian's article, and it's in Social Studies and the Early Childhood Educator. I think that's the name of it. I can send that. So what maybe I can, um, I'm, I have to figure out the resource page that's in the platform for the, for today's and tomorrow's events. Um, I can, if there's a way to put links in there, I'll do that. Yeah, I believe Sarah. Yeah, I was say, if you just shoot me what you'd like in there, I can get it popped in the resource area for you. Okay, will do. Thank you. And just a fun share that Leilani is actually a grantee. Mm -hmm. ah, she's terrific. Oh, her books. I Yeah, so this is a very different kind of presentation than I normally do. Usually I talk about her work, her books um, for teachers, one about Lewis and Clark. She's got one that I think teachers should use. And anytime they're approaching Lewis and Clark in their teaching materials, whether it's in a textbook or otherwise, they need to see her book because the way that Lewis and Clark is presented is very, very narrow. Um, and she's making space for Native points of view about Lewis and Clark. Good stuff. I think we're done. I think we're tapped yeah, I'm thinking that that's it. I think there are no more questions. Just a lot of love in the chat. And um, <laughs> that's a great way to end on. So <laughs> great note to end. Well, thank you for inviting me. And I do hope people will write to me. And um, I can come and do workshops for you and do mm -hmm. more work together. So absolutely. Thank you. Well, we will be in touch, definitely. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Reese. Alrighty, bye-bye.